And so the development of the flotation tanks um, originally began with uh, John Lilly. And so this began with research at the National Institute of Mental Health in the 1950s. And John was also working with Peter Sudfeld as well. The initial studies were really focused on full submersion of a person in water to see what would happen to them after they'd spent prolonged periods of time under the water. And they were wearing on top of their head the equivalent of uh, like a, a diving bell suit helmet. So those big round ones with the circular uh, kind of window at the front. Um, so they, they've got a, a pocket of air inside there for their head to move around in. It's just the entire body was submerged under the water. So it really was starving them to a large extent of normal auditory and visual perception while they were down there. I think they were somewhat deprived of light as well. But they still had a sort of floating sensation while under there. Um, and so by the 1950s, Lily with colleagues developed the technique further to include floating in isolation as well. So beyond um, the masks and the helmets that they got as well, they wanted to put Epsom salt within the water, so magnesium sulfate. And this involved tanks being developed to create this sedimentary deprivation env environment, a regulation of water to the body temperature as well, blood temperature. So when you were in there and you were floating around, you didn't feel hot, you didn't feel cold. Typically when people were inside the flotation tanks, you would be naked. Um, and so any swimming costume, bathing costume, you weren't feeling the restriction of that. Um, whether it be tight material or loose material, you're not feeling it either gently touching your body or restricting your body in any way. And this is why people that have been in the tank also reported and still report perinatal experiences as well, believing that they're in a giant womb and they're having a rebirthing experience. The Epsom salt is put inside the water to a ratio of about 53% in there. So it doesn't matter what size, weight, shape you are, what position you decide to lie down in the water, uh, preferably face up, <laughs> but you're not going to sink. Um, it really is odd when you're in there. And certainly when I've been in there, uh, it's about a foot and a half deep. It's very strange when you put your hand underneath yourself and you can't feel the bottom, um, but you feel resistance from the water as well because of the salt content being so high. But it allows you to float and you're floating, you're not feeling hot, you're not feeling, feeling cold, and you're in darkness, so it's a very, very unusual experience. John Lilly himself spent several hours at time inside the tanks. Um, this was also incorporated with psychedelic reactants as well. He was exploring altered states of consciousness. They wanted to look at, well, what essentially was going on when people spent long periods of time in the darkness. This is also extended from studies in psychology where they'd even taken people and put them in rooms where they deprived them of light and the ability to know whether it was daytime or nighttime. And even some studies where people, um, sorry, even some studies where people were put into um, caves and got <laughs> sent to live in a cave for a few weeks to see how this would affect their, uh, um, their conscious awareness while they're in there and also what happens to them when they came out. Um, but John was combining LSD and ketamine while he was in the tanks and sometimes spending up to five or six hours inside the tanks as well. Any of you that have followed his career, it became somewhat unusual, I think, by the 1970s and 80s, um, especially with some of his work with dolphins as well. Um, I think largely some of this was to do with LSD and ketamine that uh, John was taking, but he's a very intelligent man. Um, but I think like um, many uh, people that we look at through time that have gone to the lengths of making discoveries, sometimes their own discoveries have destroyed them somewhat. So colleagues such as Peter Sufeld, he really went in a, a sort of a different direction to John. He wasn't interested in exploring the psychedelic reactants to explore consciousness in the same way as John, but he still wanted to look at the, the benefit, flotation and sensory deprivation. He also coined the term REST, Restricted Environmental Stimulation Therapy, and he still hosts an annual conference, which is just called Float Conference, where they have researchers and people who own commercial flotation tank centers coming together every year to talk about the latest flotation tanks and also the latest research that they're doing, which has only just started to bridge the gap between consciousness studies in this regard and neuroscience, where now we have things such as waterproof um, EEG headsets. So while people are in there, we can look at brainwave activity while they're floating. And so we have to rewind back to 1969 and as the guest dinner speaker at the Parapsychological Association's 12th Annual Convention, which was held in New York City, 
Um, and so um, originally, before the research in parapsychology books, which was a, a summary of the abstracts that came out, I think between 1972 and 1993, before then, the Parapsychological Association issued um, eight volumes of their proceedings in parapsychology. And the great thing was they transcribed all the kinds of talks that went on, including the guest dinner speech. And Lilly entitled his guest dinner speech for this, Inner Space and Parapsychology. And he spoke about flotation tanks, what he'd been doing, and how he thought they would be a, a benefit to parapsychology. So to quote Lilly, this is one of the things that he said, the fundamental scientific question is whether all the experiences are a creation of one's own mind, or whether one is uh, receiving things from other entities, other humans, other animals, we will say, or from unknown sources. So when he talks about these experiences and the creations of one's own mind, he's talking about the hallucinations that people have when they're inside the tank. Um, from my own experience, I can certainly say that they're, they're pretty instantaneous when that lid shuts and you're in complete darkness, you've turned off any safety light. And I've been involved in research where um, we've used, used Gansfeld as well. So Gansfeld, um, many of you may be familiar with it, but for those of you that aren't, this is another form of, of sensory deprivation. Um, but you will be in a reclining chair um, and you will go through a relaxation um, instruction on the headphones that you're wearing for about 15 to 20 minutes, telling you to stretch your arms out or stretch your legs and then let go. And, and just try and um, get rid of any feeling of your body while you're in there. You're also wearing eye shields, which are essentially half ping pong balls over your eyes and asked to look through them into red light. Um, and so that there's another form of it. And through that red light, which creates a pink haze, visions or anything that you're hearing starts to come forward. But with the tanks, uh, I still find this a much quicker process for inducing these altered states of consciousness. Lily experienced this and he thought, well, if we're getting this imagery, where is it coming from or what can we do with it? Say if someone had set up targets somewhere, would the imagery relate to it in any way? So he proposed a sender receiver set in the tank while guarding for any forms of sensory leakage. The study would include independent judges to rate the feedback. Sounds like a fantastic idea. And he encouraged others to follow in such research. So when you read the whole speech in, um, I think it's volume six of the Proceedings of the Parapsychological Association, 1969, sounds like a fantastic idea. So I went a few issues ahead to look at what happened in the following conference proceedings and the one after that. And then I looked through all the research in parapsychology issues and then the proceedings thereafter when they were printed bigger, I could not find anything. And then I, I trawled through all the Journal of Parapsychology, the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research, the European Journal of Parapsychology, and on and on and on. I, I really went to the full extent with all the journals, manually going through them, checking the indexes, and then even then going from page to page looking for things, trying to look for key things in titles and studies. Very few things came up. And so I wanted to know why, because I'd been to so many conferences for psychical research and parapsychology worldwide. Um, usually when we took a break, had a coffee break, or we were having dinner, sometimes people would mention flotation tanks and getting one installed in a university that's doing parapsychology research and having a bit of a laugh and banter about it. But why is that such a bad idea? Why hasn't anyone gone ahead and done that? Um, and so I was trying to fit all of these pieces together and find out what was going on. And so throughout most of literature review, in which I did find some things, which I'll mention um, later, um, I also looked for references to parapsychology using the tanks in some way or the flotation method to explore the limits of human consciousness. And so the furthest back that I could go, and some people had mentioned it when I was doing this research, they had seen this film. One is The Mindbenders with um, Dirk Bogard and I think Mary Yeur, who was the wife of the Jaws actor, Robert Shaw. Um, they star in this film, The Mindbenders, and it is about a group of scientists at a university exploring isolation and wanting to know what this does to the uh, human consciousness, or as they refer to it, the human soul. And so they go through, uh, from a very crude method, which you can see in the top left-hand corner there, where someone is effectively in a diving bell suit, um, but they're, they're hooked in and they're suspended in the middle of the tank um, that does not contain Epsom salt, it's just ordinary water, um, and they want to know what happens to someone while they're in that state. And so I've included a little clip for you 
hopefully this works fine and you can all hear it. What makes you think it's got anything to do with temperature? It hadn't anything to do with low temperature. Don Boulevard and our student guinea pigs had been affected not by the cold, but by their prolonged isolation. 